You good? Hey, I'm so glad to be with y'all this morning. Um, I've been going hard in the paint with little kids, and so I haven't gotten to be here in the morning meetings quite as much as I'd like. But I met a couple of y'all at Zoe's yesterday. As I was meeting y'all, I turned around, and my kid has taken a leak on a tree. But it was like right in the middle of Dustin Commons, like the landscaping. So I was like, hey, I got to go. So I look forward to getting to know y'all a little bit more. I'll show you a picture of my children. I'm married to Joel, the frat star in the back. And um, Emma Grace is our little girl. Dakota's our little boy, who we're teaching not to use the bathroom outside. Okay, so I've been on staff for 10 years. I uh, worked at Marshall University. We are Marshall, where I graduated from, and then uh, Charlotte for a couple years. And then the past six years, we spent at Carolina um, USC. So that's been fun. We just made a transition in August to Ole Miss, and we are loving Oxford and being there and cheering hotty toddy because that's where Joel went to school. So we're good, um, feeling like that's a good place to put down roots for us. Um, a year ago, in April, we stood in front of a judge, and it was kind of intimidating, and we held those two little kids I just showed you, and we officially adopted them into our family. And it has been like the joy of our life to bring two little kids who were headed for just misery, who they were in the middle of misery with abuse and neglect and just awful things. And it's brought so much joy into our lives to bring them home and to make it legal and official. And it's been sweet to hear them start to ask less questions about who's my next mommy and daddy going to be and more questions about you know, what their life's going to be as a part of our family. So you'll get to know them. But what I wanted to share with you all this morning is kind of the picture of adoption when it comes to Christianity. Um, Jeff spoke about a great tool that you can have in your tool belt to share the gospel. And I'm going to share another tool that you can use that you all have on your seats. Um, But before I do, I want to share, kind of open up with a movie clip from The Guardian. I don't know if you all have seen The Guardian with um, Kevin Costner and Ashton Kutcher. But I wanted to share this clip. And as you see it intro, think through evangelism, sharing Christ with others, kind of in the context of um, this movie. And we're going to hit the lights, if that's possible. Am I no lights? We got lights? John, will you hit those lights? Thanks, y'all. Okay, so we're going to show that movie clip, and then we'll keep talking about evangelism. So think about that. legend of a man who lives beneath the sea. He is a fisher of men, the last hope of all those who have been left behind. Many survivors claim to have felt his gripping hands beneath them, pushing them up to the surface, whispering strength until help could arrive. But this, of course, is only a legend.
door! Cabin door! Out of the 39,000 men and women who make up the United States Coast Guard, there are only 280 rescue swimmers. This is because we are the Coast Guard's elite. We are the best of the best. When storms shut down entire ports, we go out. When hurricanes ground the United States Navy, we go out. And when the Holy Lord himself reaches down from heaven and destroys his good work with winds that rip houses off the ground, we go out. And the attrition rate at this school is well over 50%. So if by some miracle you actually have what it takes to become one of us, then you get to live a life of meager pay with the distinct possibility of dying, slow, cold, and alone, somewhere in the vast sea. However, you also get the chance to save lives. And there is no greater calling in the world than that. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to A School. Are there any questions? Okay. Have y'all seen that movie? Raise your hand if you've seen it. I'm like, how old am I? Okay, I think we're good. All right. Y'all share with me, what were some of the observations you made? What were some of the hard things that rescue swimmers go through? Or if you know anything about Navy SEALs, what are some hard things they go through in order to be trained in A School? Okay, let me tell you. I didn't know this until recently, but they will actually drown you, resuscitate you, and make you like go through that process in order to make you not afraid of water. You get hypothermia, you gotta get in like these little torpedo missiles, and you have to stay there. So if you're claustrophobic, you're screwed. I mean they just they put you through an incredible amount of men it's all really mental but a ton of intense training. Why? Because you have the privilege to go out and to save lives. And so as I thought about that movie, when I watched it, I was like, man, that is totally the Christian life. If I'm actually living out the fact that I have been rescued and I get to go and rescue others, that right there is the Christian life. I think yesterday Carrie spoke about Hebrews 12 and the great cloud of witnesses. If you read on, you hear about them Many of them getting sawed in two, burned alive in a, boil of, a boiling pot of um, oil. We may not have to go through those things. So that's the good news. But this is kind of an A school where y'all are going to get incredible training, tools for your tool belt, like I mentioned, and y'all are going to be asked to take steps of faith that may feel like you're getting drowned. But it's going to be totally worth it. Why? Because you may die cold and alone and with meager pay, but you get the chance to save lives. And so that's what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes, and I'm excited to do so. There is one caveat that's totally different from the Christian life and sharing our faith than rescue swimmers. That would be the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So whereas with the rescue swimmers, the pressure is totally on them to find the bodies, save the bodies. As Jeff spoke, you know the pressure is totally not on us when it comes to evangelism. Y'all, the pressure is completely on the Trinity. And the amazing thing is that we have the Trinity, the third person of the Trinity, living inside of us. And so the pressure is on the Holy Spirit to allow us to hear opportunities to share Christ, the, to give us the words to do so. And so the pressure is not on us. I hope you don't feel any kind of burden as we share, like, you need to go share your faith. It's, the pressure is not on us. The pressure is on the Trinity, and the Trinity lives in the soul of every believer. And so that's something kind of to get fired up and excited about. Um, it is a little bit sad to me, though, that majority of believers will live most of their Christian life and will never experience the joy of seeing somebody trust Christ. I don't know if you've experienced watching the light bulb go on for somebody, but y'all, it is so addicting. Being on staff for 10 years, I've gotten to see tons of girls receive Christ, and it is the most amazing thing. And so not only do I want to say it's our call as a Christian to share our faith, but it's actually like the joy of your soul. It is better than any drug. I mean, it is like amazing adrenaline to see somebody share Christ, or to see someone trust Christ as you share. Um, there's a kind of the final words that Christ left us with shows that calling in Matthew 28. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, who is with us to do it? Who is the pressure on? I, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, will always be with us to the end of the age. And then my favorite passage is in 2 Corinthians. This one is kind of my battle cry. Um, it's 2 Corinthians 5. We got that? Anyway, on a day when I'm like, ugh, I just don't know if I have it in me, I will go to this passage. Because if Christ is in me, I'm a new creation. And the old is past, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us this ministry of reconciliation. So I'm an ambassador. That is, in Christ, who is reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, but entrusting with us the, ministry of the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Implore is just a nice word for beg. And when I look at my life, sometimes I don't see my daily life as begging people to receive Christ. But when we're filled with the Spirit and we're asking him to use us, y'all, he really will. Okay, so a few things um, that will kind of help set you up for success in sharing your faith. One is to be a Christian. There is no shame, just as Alan shared, there's no shame that as you listen to Jeff, if that was the first time that you were like, dang, I thought God was lucky to have me on his team, and now I see that I'm desperately in need for him, there is no shame in admitting the gospel is becoming real in your life for the first time. That is totally an amazing experience. And so, first, you've got to be a Christian in order to share your faith. Second, um, I've shared my faith with sin in my life. It just doesn't really go as well. Like, I've been angry or held a grudge or, I can remember in college, choosing sexual sin and then going trying to do ministry. It's like, that's really dumb. God can use all of it. He uses our sin. But I can sure hear the Holy Spirit a lot more clearly when I'm in step with him and when I have no unconfessed sin in my life. So if I know I'm going to have a hard conversation with a girl and I really want to share Christ with her, I'm going to make sure I'm a Christian. I'm going to make sure I don't have any unconfessed sin. I'm going to make sure that the Holy Spirit has total access in my life to speak to me, to use scripture. And then fourth, I'm just going to go for it. By the power of the Spirit, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask God to speak through me and I'm going to step out boldly. I don't know if you're like me, but if I can just get like that first sentence going then I'm a lot more likely to be able to transition into sharing the gospel. So I've listed for y'all, I think 25 or 30, little spiritual conversation starters. Pull out that sheet, and if you didn't get one, we can, we've can we got some more in the back. If you didn't get one, raise your hand. Anybody not? Okay, so I think some of the back row, maybe not. Okay, so I'll use a lot of these questions um, to kind of start spiritual conversations. It really is sad, though. The older I get, y'all, the more sad I become to see my peers 
who have never experienced the joy of doing this with somebody. So I feel like if you can master maybe two questions that kind of become your natural flow of conversation, it'll be so much easier for you to share Christ with your friends. Two of my favorites um, are, I call it the sometimes, sometime principle. So like I'm at a Bible study at the KD house on Wednesday nights, um, and I can tell there's this whole couch full of girls, and one of them in particular seems really to be wrestling. And so I just approach her after the Bible study, and I'm like, girl, what's going on? And um, I say, sometime I would love to hear more about your spiritual journey. And I just kind of say that, and I just see what she says. And for this girl, Megan, her eyes lit up. She was like, sometime I would love that. And I'm like, well, how about sometime can be Thursday at 2 o'clock? We can go to Froyo. And she's like, okay, that sounds like a great plan. So just kind of that sometime I'd love to share, or I'd love to hear your spiritual journey. That sometime word can really open the door. It can also tell you where they're at. If they're like, oh, yeah, sometime I'd love to hear that. If they don't care, that's okay. You can keep praying and you can keep cultivating that relationship. Go to Target. Don't talk about spiritual things. That will get your relationship going. But that's sometimes principle. Sometimes I'd love to hear about your spiritual journey. Or sometime, if it's like somebody you've known for a long time, sometime I really want to talk to you about something that's on my heart. We've been friends for so long, and I really value our relationship. But I realize I've never told you anything about my core, like my spirituality. Sometime I'd love to talk about that and just see. And then it's kind of always like, well, you have something you need to tell me about? Well, just tell me now. And so some of those conversations can just happen then and there. So with Megan, I started out with, sometime I would love to, dot, dot, dot. When we got on the appointment, she didn't know it was an appointment, but in my calendar, I've got 2 o'clock on Thursday, Froya with Megan. She actually brought a friend with her, because I think she was a little bit weirded out. And so I've got Megan and Casey there. <coughs> if you're from Columbia, and we're on like Gervais Street, anyway, yeah. So right there in the middle of town. And I just said, tell me about your spiritual journey so far. Both grew up in Catholic school, both could tell you anything about the New Testament, Old Testament. They could tell you so much. And yet both of them said with their words, more or less, when I lay down at night and I close my eyes, I kind of wonder if my good outweigh my bad. So another great question that's on that sheet that I love to use, I'll say, okay, zero to 100%, how sure are you that you would die, if you were to die, that you would go to heaven? And normally what my answer was in college was I'm like 80% because I've never killed anyone, I haven't stolen since I was a little kid, and yeah, so I'm probably 80%. So if you can go ahead and share, like, I'm going to ask you a really intense question. Zero to 100%, tell the question, and then be like, I was probably like 95%, you know, whatever your true story is, don't lie, but whatever your story is, you can share there. So that's another great question to lead into. Okay, so they're with me, they're tracking, and they're like, 80%. Well, maybe 75 because of what I did last night, but probably somewhere in the upper range. And so I'm like, okay, so let's say you're standing before God, and he says, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? And they gave me their spiritual resume, as most girls, I'm sure guys, would do. If they say anything other than by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, it's the wrong answer, okay? So that led me into, and they, they said the wrong answer. So that led me into an easy presentation of my absolute favorite way to share the gospel. I've used it all through ministry, and people through over, for over a half a century have used it. It's kind of what our founder with Campus Crusade for Christ used. His name was Bill Bright, and he just condensed the Bible down into these four little points. And I'll say to girls, I have like the cliff notes, or if they're blonde, I'll say, I have the blonde version of the Bible, or I'll just make some sort of joke to make it easy to pull out what is this little booklet. And the founder of Campus Crusade actually would keep it in his tie. And so if he were on an elevator, his, his um, principle in life, his rule for his personal spiritual growth of evangelism was to put it in his tie or in his pocket, wherever. But if he had more than two minutes alone with a person, he took that as God saying, this is an opportunity to share your faith. That is so challenging to me and humbling to me. And so I, I really, I really this semester have challenged the girls I'm discipling, like, let's live that out. If we have time with people, why not go there? Because, as we see, people are lost and dying in a sea of God's wrath, and we have the chance to rescue them. Okay, so let's open this booklet. This is just a blown-up version of the little booklet that we'll get for y'all. 
It's called Would You Like to Know God Personally? So I'm sitting with Megan. We're eating frozen yogurt. I'm saying these questions. They're saying the wrong answers. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I just happened to bring this amazing booklet. It's the whole Bible condensed down to four points. Let me show it to y'all. Little do they know, I've had it and I planned on doing this. That's fine. And just in case you feel like it's weird to pull out some booklet, it's only awkward if you make it awkward. I promise. I use this with Kelsey, Kelsey McKinney O'Neill when she was in college. She's a Christian. She still talks to me. It's okay. In fact, we've heard great stories of when you share this with a large group, maybe in a fraternity house. Um, there was a guy that was named Robert, Roger Hershey, but anyway, the guy was making fun of him for sharing the booklet behind his back his freshman year. He gets to senior year, he's moving out of the fraternity house, moving his bed, he sees the booklet stuck under his bed, pulls it out, flips through it, receives Christ as his Savior and Lord based on what the booklet said, and calls the phone number that Roger had put on the back and said, I am sorry I made fun of you my freshman year because this booklet just changed my life. All that to say it's worth being a little bit socially awkward for the sake of the gospel. Okay, but it's not awkward unless you make it. I immediately will flip open to the first page, and I'll kind of fold it in half. I usually have a pen in hand, so y'all take notes as we go. Think of examples that can make this a little more user-friendly. But I'll sometimes have them read so it doesn't feel like I'm preaching to them. So maybe I'll be like, hey, Margaret, read this for me. Or With Megan and Casey, I had one for each of them. So I said, okay, Casey, you read the first point. God loves you and created you to know him personally. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Megan, do you realize what this is saying, that for God so loved Megan? Not only does God love Megan, God loves the entire world. The Africans, the Chinese, the Czechoslovakians. He loves the entire world, and yet specifically he loves you, Megan. And that's a hard concept for a lot of people to grasp, actually. Maybe not as much in the South, but in general, to the fact that we have a God that we can know and love is a hard concept. So you want to make sure that they understand that God loves them. But Casey, Megan, what prevents you from knowing God personally? Anything that they say is going to be the right answer because it will pretty much fall under the umbrella of sin. So if they say selfishness, I'm only in college, I'll deal with that when I graduate. If they say going out, whatever they say, it's going to follow, fall under the umbrella of sin going to be the right answer. So you can be like, yes, exactly. Point number two, man is sinful and separated from God, so we cannot know him personally and experience his love. Y'all, this is the point to camp out on, because unless they realize that they have a cancer of the soul, they will not realize they need chemotherapy. Ain't nobody going to sign up for chemotherapy that does not think they have cancer. So if I cannot get Megan and Casey to see that they are fallen, depraved, damned, dead in their sin, they don't care about Jesus or God's love, okay? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right there, I would write, if you're taking it, we need to use a personal example of sin. <clears throat> I'd say, so Megan, okay, here's an example of sin from my life. Today, I broke the speed limit driving to this appointment or whatever you want to say. You need to use a real tangible example of sin. And then I often get them to think of, okay, can you think of an example of sin in your life? And my good girls, they cannot. The ones who think that they're good and God's lucky, they really can't. So I'll try to use some examples to hit it home. We were eating froyo, so I just took that opportunity to be like, okay, this is kind of weird, but if I pooped in your frozen yogurt, if I pooped a lot in yours and just a little bit in yours, do you want to eat it? And they're like, oh my gosh, okay, all right, no, I don't want to eat it. Even just a hint of sin is still worthy of damnation. They're not going to use that word, but hell, okay. Well, what's interesting is that the minute I'm saying this to Casey and Megan at the frozen yogurt place, actually a manure truck dumped over in downtown Columbia. We didn't know that, but we just got this huge waft of like gaseous, terrible, nasty, sulfuric, nasty. So Megan and Casey go, because we're just talking about poop and me pooping in their ice cream, and they're like, so it looks like one of us has tooted. (laughs) And Megan goes, do you smell shit? And I was like, I do. 
she's like, I'm totally understanding what you're talking about. I've never really seen myself as sinful. We found it on the, on the news that night. The manure had trucked it, dumped over, and all of Columbia smelled like shit. So it was just really bad. But whatever you need to do to make the analogy that they are sinful, that they have a cancer of the soul, that they need chemotherapy, and the chemotherapy is the third point. We haven't gotten there yet. They need to see that all have sinned and fall, glor- fall short of the glory of God. I love the definition, man is created to have fellowship with God, but because of his own stubborn self-will, he chose to go his own independent way, and fellowship with God, with God was broken. The self-will, characterized by an attitude of active rebellion or passive indifference, is sin. So either I'm actively disobeying God or I'm indifferently not obeying God in the way I should. All sin. For the wages of sin is death. I'll underline wage, and I'll be like, what's a wage? And they'll say, minimum, like, payment. It's what you earn at your waitressing job or whatever. I'll say, yes. So for the payment of your sin, even that one little white lie that ruined your frozen yogurt, even that one little sin, you deserve, you have earned death. Spiritual separation from God. Hell. I don't know why it doesn't just say hell. I say hell. And this diagram illustrates this perfectly. So we've got God... And if I'm in America sharing this, I'll use the Grand Canyon as an illustration. God is on one side of the Grand Canyon. You are on the other. Or if I'm I'm overseas, I'll use whatever ocean is near. God is on one side of the Grand Canyon. He is so perfect. He's holy. He's just, here I am, so messed up. I cannot reach him. But I think oftentimes we try to reach him. Can you think of any ways that college students like you try to reach God? And I'll just be quiet and let them come up with those answers. Help old ladies cross the street. Give money. Go to Bible study. Go to church. So I'll write those little things beside the arrows to show them this is the way that sinful men and women try to get to God. But the third principle is the best news ever, and it's the only way to bridge the gulf. If I can tell that they're not really tracking with me, I'll just be like, I'm almost done. This is the best part. Like I'll just try to fire them up. Because I'm just going to read it, and if they're not, the Holy Spirit's not moving in their hearts right there, I'm still going to keep going, and then I'm going to leave them with the booklet and say, I want you to reread this and think about it, and will you call me or text me and let me know your thoughts and opinions? Or if ever you feel like God is drawing you to himself, I want to hear about it. Okay, but if they're tracking, this is amazing. Point three, Jesus Christ is God's only provision for man's sin. Through him alone, we can know God personally and experience God's love. But God demonstrated his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'll ask the question. I'll I'll underline while we were still sinners. I'll say, why is it important that, that we were sinful when Christ died for us? That's kind of a weird question. People don't often know the answer. I, would, I talk about this with my kids. Why is it important that you didn't have to do something to make God die for you? The example of that I'll often use is if I went and I went out on Thursday night, and I'll use whatever bar is popular at that moment. I don't miss it's the library, so that you can call your parents and be like, I was at the library. So I don't miss, I'll be like, if I went to the library or at Carolina Pavlov's on Tuesday night, and I had a job interview on Monday morning, so I've got that nasty smell of bar and beer and cigarettes, I wake up on Wednesday morning, and I'm ready to go to my job interview. I would never take a washcloth and wipe the smell off and wipe the makeup off and wipe the body over off and then get in the shower to clean. No, you take your nasty self and you get in the shower and the shower cleans you off. It is the same way when we approach God. We take our nasty selves and we don't try to clean ourselves up to get right with God. We come to him just as we are and Jesus washes us. And that can help people see it's not like, oh, I need to get to a certain place before I can come to God. And then we'll talk about um, he rose from the dead. This is a paraphrase of his life. He died for the sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He appeared to Peter, then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500. If you're talking with somebody who has some more um, intellectual objectives, this is a great place to park out, to park, and talk about the fact that we have more proof that Jesus lived and died than, who was it, Abraham Lincoln? Yeah. That Abraham, like we have more written record that Abraham Lincoln, that Jesus lived, died, and was raised than we do that Abraham Lincoln. Okay, I can get that stat figured out for you, but it's true. And then we'll flip to the most exciting part. He is the only way to God. 
Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And I'll ask the person, how does that sit with you? And if they're a pluralist or if they think there's tons of ways to God, this is going to make them mad. And so this would be a great place to camp out and to talk. But if they're cool with it, and they're like, okay, then I'm going to show them that here's our diagram again. We have a perfect God, we have imperfect man, and we are the only religion in the entire world, just as Jeff said, where God comes to man instead of man trying to get to God. So here's man dead on the bottom of the ocean. Jesus comes, he saves them, and he gives them brand new life. Y'all, there's no religion in the world that does that. And yet, a lot of people know that. Cognitively, they know that. Most of the professors on your campus would say they know that, but it's not just enough to know these truths. And I'll sometimes say there, even the demons know that, but demons are not in heaven. The fourth point, and the last point, and the most crucial point, that if I'm just talking and not using a little booklet or something, it's hard to get to this point. And the point is that we must individually receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Then we can know God personally and experience his love. <clears throat> It's hard for me to bring someone to a point of decision. But if we just give them a lot of facts without the application of the facts, that's just entertainment. Knowledge without application is just entertainment. So this is kind of where it comes home. We must receive Jesus Christ. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So wherever we are, if we're at the Froyo place, I'll be like, okay, look around. All these people are all creations of God. But according to that verse, what does it take to become a child of God? And I have seen English majors who are brilliant, who cannot read this and get the contextual clues because their eyes are blinded. And then I have seen girls who are half hungover, and they can look at that, and the Holy Spirit is opening their eyes, and they can see, to be a child of God, I have to believe and receive. Okay. So, y'all, it'll be amazing for you to see when a person really gets the fact that they want to be a child of God, they have to believe and receive. We receive Christ through faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. I'll circle grace, I'll circle saved, and I'll circle faith. Those are churchy words, and I don't want churchy words to a person who's not a Christian. That's just stupid. So I want to be like, okay, how would you define grace? Similarly to what Jeff said, you'll... Most of the time, you'll get a decent answer. I often get, it's what you say before you eat dinner. Like, sort of, yes. <clears throat> so I'll go ahead and say, grace is an undeserved gift. You do not earn it. I'll ask him, what does saved mean? For whatever reason, no one can think of a definition of saved. Can y'all? I don't know why this is such a hard one, but saved. If I saved you from a burning building, I always have to do that. If I saved you from a burning building, what is that? Rescue, Exactly. For by something you did not earn or deserve, you have been rescued through faith. Faith is a real fuzzy term. We use it a lot. I like to make it concrete, and I'll say, okay, look at that chair. That chair has four legs. I think it could hold my weight. If I just look at that and believe it, I'm believing. But if I actually look at that, believe it, and go and sit down in the chair, I'm placing my faith in the chair. So it's by something I didn't deserve that I have been rescued, not Oh, through actually sitting down, taking my weight off of anything I would do, and placing my weight on the fullness and the payment of Christ. So I want to make those words concrete. And then I'll talk about it is a gift of God, not as a result of work so that no one can boast. If I give you a gift, what's the only thing that you have to do? Take it. That is somehow revolutionary in the mind of a non-believer. All they have to do is receive it and take it. And y'all, that is the good news. That's all they have to do. Not by works, otherwise we'd brag about it. When we receive Christ, we experience a new birth. And then I oftentimes will go straight to the um, next page. <clears throat> we receive Christ by personal invitation. Christ is speaking, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. He wants that relationship with us. But receiving Christ involves turning to God from self, which is repentance, and trusting Christ to come into our lives to forgive us of our sins, to make us the kind of people he wants us to be. 
It's not just an intellectual decision. We said that. Just to agree intellectually that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died on the cross for our sins is not enough. Nor is it enough to have the camp high emotional experience. We receive Jesus Christ by faith as an act of the will. So all of my emotions and all of my mental capacity is choosing to place my faith in Christ. And Christ is doing the work of drawing me. Two circles that represent two different kinds of lives. If I literally am on an elevator and I do not have time or on an airplane or wherever, I'll just jump straight to these circles because they're super helpful. You see the one on the left is a self-directed life. And I like to draw a little line where the cross is to show that door where Christ is standing at the door and knocking. Um, I like, you can do that, you don't have to do that, but Christ is on the outside of this life and self is on the throne in control and in charge. The Christ-directed life has Christ on the throne and self is daily yielding to Christ being in control. So I'll ask the person, which circle best represents your life? And for Megan, she's like, I'm somewhere in between. I'm like, well, either you're married or you're not married. Either you're pregnant or you're not pregnant. Like either you have stood before God like on a wedding day, said your vows, and like the deal is done. Or maybe you're dating or maybe, you know, whatever. Either you are in Christ, he is, on, he is in your life, or he is not. And so to that, she answered, okay, well, if that's the case, I guess I'm the one on the left. And I'm, I just asked, which circle would you like to represent in your life? You don't have to say the one on the right just to make me, sorry, make me happy. She said, no, after hearing, like, the state of my existence, I am dying to be the one on the right. So right then and there, in the middle of frozen yogurt, we went to the next page, which explains how you can receive Christ. We can receive Christ right now by faith through prayer. Prayer is just talking to God. It's not my magic words. It's not a formula. It's also not a prayer you have to pray every day. I do not marry my husband every day. I cannot afford to do that. But every day I wake up with the knowledge and the affirmation that there's the covenant commitment, and it's not going anywhere. And so to in initiate that covenant relationship, don't have to use all those big words. Um, God knows your heart, and he's not so concerned with your words as he is with the attitude of your heart. The following is a suggested prayer, which I love. I've seen tons of girls pray this prayer in the middle of Starbucks or in the middle of Five Points in Columbia, the bar area. It's interesting. So, Lord Jesus, I want to know you personally. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Take control of the throne of my life and make me the kind of person you want me to be. I'll read through the prayer and then I'll say, does that express kind of what's going on in your heart right now? And um, a lot of times, and you can pray with expectancy that they will say it actually does. And I'll say, what would be best for you? Do you want to pray out loud? Do you want to pray in your heart? Do you want me to pray? Do you want to repeat after me? Whatever. You can give them options, but it helps just to say, let's pray this prayer together and let them be the ones to... You don't need to, you're not their priest. You don't need to, like, perform some ritual on their behalf. They need to do it as an act of their faith. Okay, so let's say, and praise God, this is what happened. Megan did receive Christ. We went through the last few pages of the booklet, how to know Christ is in your life. Because I will tell you, from the way that her life looked, she still looked like my adopted child who said, now who's gonna, my next mommy and daddy going to be? Her life was a hot mess. And she did not look like an adopted child of Christ. So I needed to assure her of the fact that if she really did place her faith in Christ, that he is in her life. Look at what the Bible promises to those who receive Christ. And then we cannot depend on feelings. Because, hello, I still wake up some days not feeling like a Christian some days. So I'll go through page 12. Page 13 is now that you've entered into a relationship with Christ, what is true of you. And then I love page 14. It talks about how to grow. Within 48 hours of a person becoming a Christian, especially for y'all, if it's in your house, you can literally get up the next morning and be like, let's go to breakfast, let's talk more about this. Because I don't know if y'all have had this experience, but the minute you receive Christ, sometimes then that feeling of, oh crap, either did I do it right, why did I do that? Like all the, Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy that seed that's been planted. And so we want to help tend that seed. It's just like a new baby. You would never leave your new baby at the hospital and go home. You want to take care of that new believer. And so with Megan, we immediately met up at Starbucks, kind of, I think, maybe the next day or two. Casey, let me just share with Casey, she's still not a believer. And 
girls are still in her life that love her and are committed to her, and she will tell you, I am not a believer, and she's, she's okay with that, but we are still praying and laboring in her life. So it's just kind of interesting that in one conversation, two can have a totally different response, but Casey got to watch this transformation. Megan has gone on to walk with Jesus, date different guys than she ever would have dated. I mean, she just has a totally different path in her life. So I'll go through the rest of the booklet. I'll get up with them 48 hours later, at least, and go through what's called the transferable concepts or some sort of new believer material that your staff has tons of copies of and can easily get to you. Um, I want to invite them to do Christian things. I want to invite them to do non-Christian things. This is now your little baby, and you've got to take care of them. If it's somebody that you've met randomly and you've just been doing initiative evangelism, you can give them your name and contact info and then just help find a church for them. I don't know if y'all saw the, saw the Moe's delivery guy that first night we were here, but one of our staff shared the gospel with him a few years ago. Just randomly, he was delivering our Moe's for Greek Summit. Baldwin said, hey, I want you to read this, see what you think. He received Christ. His whole family became Christians. They go to a church here in the area. So Baldwin just had no idea that that happened. The guy came back two years ago and said, thank you for giving me that booklet. It totally changed the course of our family. And so we can point them to a church that can do it, the church's job of helping Christians grow. Y'all, everywhere that we share this message, there will come joy. You will experience joy. The people who hear it and believe will receive, receive such joy, and it will be joy for eternity. And so if Christ really is all that the world has to offer, y'all, let's be about this. What would it look like if a hundred of us began having conversations today with friends at home, through social media, the waitresses and waiters that check us out at restaurants? What would it look like? We could start revival here, y'all. And so I'm going to kind of close with the credits, because the credits are it's just a cool Brian Adams song that... Oh, we're not going to do the credits. Just kidding. All right, so we're going to pray and close. And while I pray, let's ask God. We're going to take a quick second of silence just to ask God if there are people in your life, close friends, far off sisters and brothers and fraternities, people that you want to have spiritual conversations with, we're just going to ask God to create those. Let's just take a minute to think about the faces and names that God might put on our hearts.